Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr Brownie Wicks. Uh, this is a recording of a talk originally given at the Curator Workshop um, at the University of Edinburgh on the 9th of May 2022 um, in collaboration with University College Dublin, uh, the Centre for Culture, Data and Society and IASH at the University of Edinburgh. And in this talk today, I want to gesture towards some of the ways that I've used the curator platform to open up new avenues in my research. Um, at the time of giving the paper, I was a postdoctoral researcher on the Victor project, um, and my research there really looked at um, representations of Italian migration in Victorian fiction, and particularly on the figure of the working class organ grinder. So it seems appropriate to begin a talk on new digital platforms uh, with the frustrations of the original father of the computer, Charles Babbage. And these frustrations were over what he called street nuisances. The performers and musicians who played incessantly in the road outside his property when he was trying to complete work on his analytical machine. And indeed, Babbage was so incensed, he publishes an entire pamphlet on the subject uh, in 1864 entitled Street Nuisances. And in this pamphlet he writes, Street music robs the industrious man of his time, it annoys the musical man by its intolerable badness, it irritates the invalid, deprives the patient of that repose which, under such circumstances, is essential for his recovery, and it destroys the time and the energies of all the intellectual classes of society by its continual interruptions of their pursuits. And to enumerate the facts of his case against the street musicians, Babbage presents three tables. Uh, one, on the instruments of torture permitted by the government to be in daily and nightly use in the streets of London. A second, that offers a breakdown of musical performer by nationality. And a third, that records the encouragers of street music, typically, quote, the lower classes of society, people from the country and ladies of doubtful virtue, end quote. And so those street nuisances excoriates various instruments of torture and their wielders, including um, German brass bands and Indian tom-toms. Uh, Babbage identifies the organ grinders, natives of Italy, chiefly from the mountainous district, as the most testing culprits. He writes... The most numerous of these classes, the organ grinders, are natives of Italy. There are above a thousand of these foreigners, usually in London, employed in tormenting the natives. The Italians are often very insolent and constantly refuse to depart. But perhaps even more offensive than unpleasant epithets was the sound of the barrel organ itself, described by Babbage as hideously discordant noise, indicative of the, quote, declining character of the new population of the city, enjoyed only by Britain's, quote, most worthless classes. So the solution to this terrible nuisance, Babbage concludes, would be the enforced movement of migrant musicians from London city streets. Yet here he was also unsuccessful. He writes, the taste of the new magistrate, like that of his predecessor, is favourable to the Italian organ. Possibly Mr Y thinks that all Italian music is high art and therefore ought to be encouraged. And so the organs played on. The refrains of the Italian barrel organ reverberate across Babbage's work in street nuisances and body forth some of the tensions, assumptions and emotions that organised perceptions of street music in the 19th century and of the migrant performers who brought it loudly and vividly to life. And though he was one of street music's most insistent critics, Charles Babbage was not shouting into the void. The period between 1840 to 1865 saw a massive chronicling of complaints against the organ nuisance, as the time dubbed it, dubbed it, uh, co-signed by some of the most prominent figures of the age, Charles Dickens, Alfred Lodge Tennyson, Thomas Carlyle, Wilkie Collins, William Holman Hunt, and John Forster. And in turn, the blame for the nuisance was overwhelmingly attributed to foreign migrants, particularly working class Italian men. 
The satirical magazine Punch, for example, as Anne-Marie McAllister has shown, ran a particularly vicious campaign against Italian organ grinders during the 1850s and 1860s, publishing articles with titles such as Italian Persecution, Our Organ Grinding Tyrants and Popish Organ Nuisance, alongside xenophobic cartoons that depicted Italian organ grinders as unsanitary and unscrupulous, with ragged clothes and simian features. The campaign for the control of London's sonic environments, as it is waged by Babbage, Dickens and Punch magazine, operates along class-driven, ethnic and racialized lines. Yet it also draws attention to the historical relations between sound and power. Noise, as Jacques Attali theorises, is always already politicised. The control of noise and the institutionalisation of the silence of others assure the durability of power. For this reason, musicians, even when officially recognised, are dangerous, disturbing and subversive. So Attali raises the insurgent potential of sound, particularly when it is generated by unregulated groups perceived to be foreign outsiders. Yet conceived as meaningless noise, the music of 19th century migrants has also been prone to distortion and abstraction. Defined against the industrial intellectual economy of British brain work, foreign noise is rendered as defective labour, a fault in the machine that deviates from and resists productivity, and that can corrode social systems altogether. For Seb Franklin, it is the sound of unupgradeability, the sonic mark of a racialized and feminized urban surplus. Organ grinders and their encouragers are figured in 19th century discourses as a non-value mediated population, and as such, Franklin argues, are objected. And street music is likewise attenuated, no longer seen as a practice with potential community building or life making aspects, but posed as mere aesthetic formlessness. So the tenor of the organ nuisance discourses uh, is hostile, violent and freighted with xenophobia, class conflict and racism. But organ music as a sonic disturbance vibrates with aesthetic and political potential. And in turn, the organ grinder becomes an efficacious figure for Victorian writers. And in what remains of this paper today, I want to explore how the curator platform might enable us to access that potential and to open new avenues of research to help clarify and better hear how Italian migration and music resonated in the 19th century and to retrieve the figure of the Italian organ grinder from the position of uninhabitable static in which it finds itself. So Italian organ grinders rarely take centre stage in Victorian fiction and providing easy searchable access to the British Library's vast digitised 19th century collection, Curator has enabled me to identify and assemble my own organ grinding archive, uh, but also to trace the sounds of migrant street music across canonical and non-canonical texts. So searching for the word organ is going to bring up far too many results and some that aren't really relevant for our purposes. Um, so I use more specific terms to create my organ grinder corpus. And searching through the curator archives, the same tensions identified in the mid-century anti-street music discourse between middle class and migrant labour, public and private spaces, sound and silence, appear within the literary texts of the period. Uh, typically, these tensions I've found are expressed through depictions of invasion, with the Italian organ grinder intruding into the sacred Victorian household, usually by nefarious means. And I found fiction by 19th century British authors, but also by Italian migrants themselves living and working in Britain um, that feature organ grinders sometimes even more directly. Uh, such as works by Antonio Galenga, an Italian political exile who was part of uh, the Young Italy Revolutionary Group. Curator has also helped me develop the broader conceptual frameworks of my project through uh, the use of its inbuilt digital tools. Uh, for example, one notion that kept appearing throughout my research into Italian migration was that organ grinders were perceived to be nuisances. 
So we see that word nuisance appearing in Babbage's work as the title of his pamphlet. Uh, it's in various newspaper headlines and in Punch magazine articles, um, but it also occurs even in contemporary academic writing. Uh, Lucia Sponza, for example, in a study on 19th century Italian economic migration, argues that Italian working class migrants were an unusual case. In contrast to immigrant groups, Italian workers did not typically compete with Britons in the labour market and their numbers remained fairly low. So the hostility and the clamour of the anti-street music debate seems disproportionate and offering an interpretation, Sponza asserts, the Italian working class migrants brought their original trades with them or set up independent and exotic activities. Their numbers steadily increased but never reached the massive level of the Jews. Their presence therefore, both in qualitative and quantitative terms, was normally regarded as a superficial nuisance. So as Sponsor's discussion suggests, anti-Italian sentiment during this period was more complex than a response to a perceived foreign other. Instead, it appears to be jointly activated by the perception that 19th century Italian migrants were nuisances, a word used perhaps unintentionally here by Sponsor, but one that, as I've said, reoccurs throughout um, these various historical and contemporary discourses. So what does it mean to be a nuisance in the 19th century? And in a larger project that's developed out of this research, uh, that's what I've been trying to find out. Following its legal definition at this time, to be a nuisance is to produce that which is offensive to the senses, rendering the enjoyment of life and property uncomfortable. Nuisance law is a zoning power, a relation to property and space that is subtended by a desire for peace, order and the good life. Nuisance, on the other hand, can be understood as a form of unwanted sensory encounter with external environments. And it's a term that in the 19th century gets applied to diverse social bodies, industries, matter and ecological phenomena. Uh, from city smog, to feral animals, to discarded waste, to bath chairs, uh, to river pollution, to Romany populations, to migrant street musicians. So through its disruptive sensory capacities, nuisance is policed, uh, but it also maintains this unique effective power and it aligns itself with other modes of disruptive politics and action. And curator's semantic uh, visualization tools helps us see some of these connections between these different political concepts. So in this type of network, each node or circle represents a word and each edge or link between two nodes indicates a semantic association between the corresponding words. So if we use nuisance, noise and mob, for example, we can begin to see some of the overlaps between these aesthetically and politically charged words, clamour, uproar, commotion, disturbance, hubbub, deafening, words that kind of vibrate with um, rebellious energy, I suppose, um, in ways that gesture towards their kind of efficacy, their vibrancy. Uh, similarly, you can replace nuisance with hurdy-gurdy, which is a specific kind of barrel organ, and we begin to see even more intriguing associations. So using these tools has helped me uh, rethink how I approach migrant street music um, and offers a way of um, reading Victorian literary representations in a different manner. It helps me um, sort of see organ grinders or approach uh, Italian organ grinders not as a demonized surplus, but as political actors in their own right. Uh, actors who kind of maintain this nuisance power and energy. And to conclude this talk, I want to offer a brief close reading from one of the texts that I found using uh, the curator platform in the British Library's 19th century digitized collection. And this text is Lady Maud's Mania by G. M. Fenn, a tragedy in high life published in 1890. So Fenn's work is little read now, but in his time, he was a prolific literary author, most known for writing juvenile adventure fiction.
set in London amongst uh, British high society, Lady Maud's mania is somewhat of an outlier in Fenn's literary oeuvre, focused not on the outward journeys of boy heroes to the colonies, but reflecting instead on the inward movements of European migrants into Britain and the effect that these migrations have on Victorian social life. As its subtitle suggests, Lady Maud is a social satire written in the melodramatic mode. Music is thus an integral part of its narrative rhythm, content and structure. But the novel's music is not generated by a sumptuous Victorian orchestra, but instead by a barrel organ wielded by a handsome Italian organ grinder named Luigi Malsano. And from the outset, the novel signals Malsano's complex role and the importance of migrant music making. Lady Maud is bookended by the sounds of organ grinding, registered in its opening and closing dialogues. Confound those organs, said the Earl of Barmouth, and frustrate their grinders, cried Viscount Dipfoos. They are such a nuisance, my boy. So Fenn repeats this framing strategy throughout the text, with several chapters beginning or ending with barrel organ music. This pattern recalls the repetitive nature of organ grinding itself, evoking the instrument's mechanical loops, which in turn contributes to the novel's claustrophobic atmosphere. Yet organ music also proves to be a generative affect in the text, providing a sonic structure that connects the closeted action of the upper class domestic space with the vibrant social worlds outside. And immediately the novel raises the pervasive quality of sound and its nuisance potential, referenced explicitly here in its opening lines. They are such a nuisance, my boy but in a way that actually ends up calling attention to the artificial nature of Victorian social codes. So the event that Malsano's music intrudes upon is the forced nuptials of Maud's sister Diana to a wealthy colonial administrator. And after these nuptials, a melancholy Diana is described as being carried towards Charing Cross en route for Brindisi, the Suez Canal, India, right away out of the country and out of this story. So in its very first uh, chapter, marriage is presented as a form of social and economic mobility, but one that can also be disorienting, juxtaposing the faux harmony of the wedding and the wedding bells with the tinny strains of the Italian barrel organ playing outside uh, the room. Uh, the novel stages an opposition between emigration and immigration, absence and presence, female and male, and questions the authenticity of such binaries. Malsano, the organ grinder, though a foreign nuisance, nevertheless maintains his agency and he remains present in the narrative. Diana, the new bride, on the other hand, disappears and is forever silent. So the intersections between gender, sound and power in the novel are also explored in the later relationship between Luigi Malsano and the eponymous Lady Maud. Having been placed under house arrest by her family, Maud finds comfort listening to Malsano's organ music, which he plays under her window every day. So through song, the novel parodies the sanctity of the Victorian domestic space and reroutes the directionality of British familial and class-driven power dynamics. Malsano's uh, barrel organ eventually becomes Maud's obsession, the focus of her titular mania, and she appears to be experiencing a kind of mental breakdown through her domestic imprisonment. Here, Fenn prefigures themes evoked in Charlotte Perkin Gilman's uh, famous The Yellow Wallpaper, uh, but it is the uncanny repetitions of the barrel organ that come to symbolise the oppressive structures of society, rather than repeated patterns of the, on the wall. Additionally, Maud's frustrations align with the nuisance power of the barrel organ, wasted, vibrating female energy full of insurgent potential, but limited by crushing social expectations and rules. Importantly, however, it's the music of the barrel organ that actually presents Maud with a way out of her predicament. Using the refrains of particular songs as a secret code, Maud and Malsano plot her escape. She absconds from her family home, dressed in Malsano's organ grinder's garb, and elopes with her English lover to Italy. 
wearing the costume of the Italian organ grinder, more dons the mobility of the migrant figure, moving through the streets and across gendered, class-driven and eventually geographical boundaries. Foreignness is likewise shown to be a malleable concept, something that one can co-opt in order to ex uh, escape social regulations, in turn exploding the notion that to be a nuisance is limited to one ethnic or social identity. Eventually, however, social order is restored, and at the end of the novel, Maud and her new English husband are discovered in Italy, and her family gives them their blessing. Malsano, the organ grinder, makes no further appearances, and yet Italian barrel organ music can still be heard in the novel's final lines. Reconciled here as music rather than nuisance, street music appears to signal future harmony for Maud and her family and acts as a curtain call for Fenn's melodrama in high life. Just then, an organ sounded in the square and his lordship stopped his ears. No, no, governor, it's only music and I like that. Here's Maud, Viscount Dipfooth said, filling his glass, and may she never more be mad. By deploying the sounds of the barrel organ in such a way, um, the novel recalls the opening marriage plot, uh, and in turn it therefore concludes on a rather ominous note, rather than a happy ending. Though Maud has married a man that she loves, ultimately the marriage will put restrictions upon her life, and her freedoms will never be as great as the unchecked mobility she experienced in the guise of the organ grinder. The uncanny continued loops of the barrel organ thus raise the superficiality of the novel's happy ending and suggest that Maud might nevertheless be stifled in her new existence. Street music thus maintains its disconcerting nuisance power, its refusal to remain silent, and in doing so it exposes the uneven rhythms of 19th century social life. In turn, the Italian organ grinder is also mobilised and he's mobile, shifted from a position of relative liminality on the streets into the reverberating heart of Victorian text. Thank you.